There's a cartoon called Avatar The Last Airbender. And it's a cartoon that I'd actually recommend for adults and children alike. It's a very smart, well done story. And there's a lot uh, to learn from it. Now, th the story of Avatar is set in this world where you have some people who can bend some of the elements. Earth, water, fire, and air. So these are the four elements that some people can bend. And, and the story revolves around Aang, a young 12-year-old who is known as the Avatar. So the person who pops up every generation, who doesn't just know one of the elements, but can, can bend all of them. And Aang, unfortunately, too, has been trapped in the ice for a hundred years. So think kind of like Captain America. They're trapped in the ice for all that time and then is finally released and finds himself in a new world that uh, he's called on to be a spiritual guide and, and to help protect. And in one of his journeys with his friends, uh, he finds himself having to be a spiritual guide to two tribes who don't get along with each other. They've been warring for over a hundred years at this point. And Aang uh, asks his friends to go and see what it is exactly that's going on with these tribes. Why are they not getting along? And they find out that one side says that the other took their special sacred orb that they use for their rituals. And the other side says, no, we were returning the orb, and our person was, our, our leader was wrongly imprisoned. Well, so when Aang hears about how long this has been going on and the names of these tribes' ancient leaders, he says, no, 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 you, you've got it all wrong. There, there was no ritual. It was just a game, a game sort of like soccer. The orb was just a ball that was used for this game. And these, these two leaders actually got along. They were children, in fact. Like What you're describing is this game that they had with each other. And they loved each other and respected each other very much. So the tribes with this newfound knowledge you know, realized that maybe there, there aren't quite as many differences between them as they thought. And they come together. Then Aang's friends come up to him and say, man, that was really lucky that you just happened to know these people. And Aang says, well, I actually didn't. I made the whole thing up. Now, I'm not, ad I'm, I'm not advocating lying here. I, I want to be very clear about that. But I think the importance of this story is that it is very realistic, right? I mean, we, we want to believe what Aang says because that seems to be something very likely to happen, that we would mess up and forget where these traditions actually came from, that we would stop worshiping in the right way and start worshiping in the wrong way. And this seems so realistic because it actually happens. And we see that in our readings this morning. The very beginning in Deuteronomy, Moses tells the people, the Israelites, that if they are, are doing, that they're following the law, that is, if they're worshiping the right way, that God will be in the midst of them. Because they will be so wise in following these precepts. God will be in the midst of them. God will dwell with them. And there will be a sign of wisdom to all the other nations. Because they'll be like, wow, look at this group of people. Who their God is so close together with them. That they can just ask. And he will answer. Now, let's fast forward from that moment to Jesus' time. And we see today the, the Pharisees and some of the scribes coming 
and saying, why aren't you washing your hands like you're supposed to? Well, unfortunately with this reading, we only get a, a bit of it. We only get parts. And, and I'd actually encourage each and every one of you to, to go after this service. Pick up your Bibles and, and look at Mark 7. And just read, read the whole chapter there. Read this, these bits that we didn't get in our lectionary. And it's after uh, Jesus' quoting from Isaiah that we heard in our reading today that we hear you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to keep your own tradition. And what Jesus then goes on to explain, the, the important bit that we missed in our reading this morning, is one of these examples of what some of these Pharisees and some of these scribes have done is to allow for a rule that basically says that you can take money that you would have given for your parents, your father and your mother, and you can say to them, well, I'm going to give this as an offering to God. Now, uh, literally what the command honor thy father and mother means is to make your parents heavy. The idea there being that we make sure that we take care of our parents so that their needs are met, so that they are able to be nourished, made heavy. Basically, that we make sure that our parents who can no longer take care of themselves, have the means to be taken care of. And what Jesus is pointing out, rightly, is that this rule, that you can take that money that you would use to, to help your parents and give it directly as an offering to God, circumvents this command. It takes away the ability to honor your father and mother. It, it, it forgets the purpose of the commandments. And so what he's saying is that these add-ons to the law, the, these different interpretations that have come about over the years, are, are not only getting away from the original point of the law, but they're also allowing people to even be able to break it. Now, the purpose of the law, as, as we hear, heard in James this morning, is to make sure that we take care of the widow and orphans. This is something that's been said throughout the Old Testament. This is not anything new that James is saying. It's something that's been there for a long time. And it's something that the Israelites really seem to have trouble getting. And what that means to help the widow and the orphan is to help those in our midst who can't help themselves. The widows and orphans of the Old Testament times and of Jesus' time. What it means is that we're meant to live together as a community and to take care of one another. We hear that said in a different way. Not only this morning, but almost every morning that we come here at St. Paul's to worship. We hear it in the two great commandments. That we are called to love God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. These two great commandments are not mutually exclusive. They're really one commandment because if we love God, we're doing God's will. And as James calls us to be doers of the word, that means doing what God wants in this world, which is for us to love one another, to love our neighbor, as ourselves. 
Because God loved us so much that he was willing even to die so that we wouldn't have to die anymore. Right worship, right belief, it's not about arbitrary guidelines that we give ourselves, but it's about living with one another, being in community with one another. There's many ways we can see this in the world. For one way we can do this is to go to colonial Haiti whenever there's worship going on. And those like me who have been there for these services can tell you that the people there love having someone there to be with them. You feel the love in that worship. And through that, you feel God being closer to you. You can go to Project Horseshoe Farm and see the work being done there and see the people that we serve there love having new faces and old faces come and be with them. Next summer, you can go over and see the work going on at Sawyer. And you can see just the joy that is in these children's eyes as people from all across the state come down to be with them, to help them, to worship with them. When our worship and doing is centered on love and community, that's when God is in the midst of us. That's when we live out what Moses said, what Moses wanted for the people. For God to be so close that he's really dwelling with us, that he's there in the midst with us. And we will hear more about that in the words of our hymn coming up very shortly. That where true charity and love dwell, God himself is there. This isn't to say that it's always easy to love our neighbors. This also isn't to say that we won't sometimes fail at loving our neighbors. But it is saying that our goal, that the hope, is that we will persevere, that we will grow in our love, and that we will continue to strive to show the same love that God showed us to one another. I was asked early on in my time here what I hope to accomplish at St. Paul's. And I'll answer it right here, right now. My hope is that each and every one of you will become stronger as Christians. It will go stronger in your faith. Now James this morning tells us that we should give. And my hope is, is that the church will be one of those places. And that specifically St. Paul's will be one of those places that you give with your time or financially. But my further hope is that you will take all of your life and make that a gift to God, to the world, to show that love. My hope is that you will give financially in such a way that shows that love. Or if not, you'll give your time to help others, to care for others. Or preferably that you'll do a little bit of both. That is my hope for you all today. My hope is, is that you will continue to spread that love to all that you may meet. You will spread the love of God to all of them. And my hope is that you will help us as a church to be better at doing that too. To be better at spreading God's love to everyone you meet. My hope is that your worship 
will not just end here on Sunday, but your worship will be throughout the week, that you will be, as James says, doers of the word. My hope is that you will continue to love God, continue to do his will, and thus love your neighbor as yourself. And I hope most of all that your worship, that your doing, will be one of joy, not only here on Sunday, but throughout the week, throughout your lives. And my hope is through that. God will dwell with you so closely that you won't think about a time that you can't hear his voice. You will constantly hear God speaking to you throughout your life.